Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Donna Holic from Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> I'm really grateful to be sober today and really honored to be here on this panel. I had been um, toying with the idea of whether to come to the conference or not, and Monday I got my answer when I was asked to speak on the panel. Um, I was asked to speak on steps one, two, and three, and it's really done me a lot of good over the week to think about to really think about the steps and go back and read my 12 and 12 and big book and things like that. And the first step, um, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Long before I came to AA, I admitted that I was alcoholic to myself. Um, I didn't think I was powerless over alcohol. So for, for me, there's two real important parts of this step. The powerlessness over alcohol and the unmanageability of my life. I came to AA purely out of fear, and I had nowhere else to go. I had tried churches, and I had tried psychiatrists. I had even tried hypnotism, and it didn't work. And I got to AA, and one of my sponsors said, you know, just keep coming back to meetings. And I went to meetings, and I admitted at my second meeting, I said, I'm Donna, and I'm an alcoholic. And I said it so that you people would like me and that I'd be part of the group. But I sat there for a long time wondering, am I alcoholic or, or do I just have I exaggerated this problem too much? And as far as the unmanageability of my life, I thought, no way. I had always felt like I was in control and everything was up to me, regardless of the fact that I was on probation at work I was up to my neck in credit card bills because I, I had gotten to the point in my drinking where my paycheck wasn't enough and Master Charge covered the rest. And, you know, my life was unmanageable. Emotionally, I could handle nothing. And I went to enough meetings. You know, they, they said, just keep coming back. And I went to enough meetings where I finally believed that I was indeed powerless over alcohol and that indeed my life was unmanageable. <laughs> and I started to like being sober. It took me a long time to start to like being sober. Um, I went to meetings, and I was miserable for a long time. And then they said, you know, follow the steps in order. And so I read the next step, came to believe in a power a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And I looked at it real quick, and I thought, well, I believe in God. I'll skip that. I'll just pop over that. And the second step in my program has been the most difficult step. Um, coming to believe in a power greater than myself. I have a, I had a hard time with it, and someone said, read the little red book. And in there, the thing I picked out the most was, the people who have a hard time with the second step have a hard time with pride. And that was my biggest problem. Um, I still thought that I was the one who was keeping me sober, and I thought I could continue to keep me sober, but I couldn't. And I, I slowly slowly came to believe. And a woman who took me into her house um, when I got sober, this is also how unmanageable my life was. I was no longer capable of living on my own. And her family let me stay with them for a year and a half. And we were talking one day and I, about faith and stuff, and she said, I know that you don't read the Bible, but I know that you believe in a God. And she, she told me the story of the mustard seed. And that if you have the faith of a mustard seed and you nurture that faith, it will grow. And I, I could grasp that, you know, because my sponsor had been saying pray. And I, you know, I thought, oh, brother. And slowly I did that. You know, the, the cliche in AA, fake it till you make it, has really worked for me. I prayed and I didn't know why I was praying. And all of a sudden I was praying and I was meaning it. And I do believe today that AA is a power much greater than myself because AA has helped keep me sober with the help of God, who in my life is a power greater than AA that keeps AA alive. So, and I had trouble with the word sanity. Um, that too for me is false pride, you know, because I was about as crazy as they came when I got here. Today, um, 
I, I still have a hard time sometimes with the second step, not with the alcoholism, but with the other areas of my life when I feel like I have to do something. And I'm constantly reminded to get on my knees and ask for help. And a lot of my prayers are simply for the strength to carry on. And then you get into the third step and made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Well, it took me about a year to find a God that I understood. And people in Grand Rapids know that I looked for everybody else's God. You know, I, I went back to the Catholic Church. I got into the charismatic movement. I, I tried the Protestant church. I tried all kinds of things, hoping that you could give me your God. And it didn't work. And pretty much at the same time as um, this, the mustard seed story is when I, I began to believe that I had to find my own God and to understand my God, not somebody else's. And that's, for me, that's where I'm at with the third step today. But originally, in, in my early days in AA, I had um, taken an exam I work in a profession that you have to be registered at and take a national exam. And I had failed it um, four times drunk. And I came into AA, and three months after I got sober, I had to take this exam again. And I, I thought I had taken the third step, so I didn't study or anything, and it was all up to God. <laughs> and, you know, this, this exam, it's four hours long, and there's lots of questions, and... When you don't study, you fail exams. But I got there, and you know there were multiple choice, and I'd say, okay, God, you answer. <laughs> I failed the exam. <laughs> and then on my, my sixth try, six months later, my sixth and final try, right after I had failed the exam, my sponsor said, why don't you ask for the strength to study? And an amazing thing happened. I studied for the six months for that exam, and I passed. And for me, I believe the third step, I can't just say it's in God's hands and he's going to do it. For me, it involves willingness and action. And the third step prayer in the big book is one of the most important prayers in my life today. I use the serenity prayer a lot, but I, on page 63 in the big book is the prayer that I pray the most. And I don't, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I'm so nervous. I can't stand it. <laughs> I got two worry stones today. Okay. I, I, um, I pray today that I let God work through me to help other people. And I'm going to close with the third step prayer that has become real important to me. And that is, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. And for me, I believe God's will is for me to continue to stay sober with the help of AA. Thanks. Thank you, Donna. Uh, next, we have Bill O. from the Troy Sterling area, and he's going to talk about traditions 4, 5, and 6, uh, steps 4, 5, and 6. Thank you, Walt. My name is Bill. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a firm believer that uh, today that uh, I'm going to be on shaky ground if I don't take the fourth, fifth, and sixth steps. The fourth and fifth. Uh, and I didn't do it the easy way because when I came to this program, I was going to do everything my way, and that was it. Uh, I made feeble attempts at taking a fourth step, and they said searching is fearless, and I wasn't going to do that. Uh, when I finally got ready after 18 years of fighting this program, fighting the people in it, and fighting myself, uh, that's when I decided to do the fourth step, and this is why I entered into the program rather than just screwing around with it. Uh, I found the person I wanted to do. Uh, my fifth step with, and I did my fourth and fifth step at the same time. And I had to, I had heard over all these years in this period of time is that I had to unload everything gut level and get rid of everything. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to look at Bill for one thing. 
these are the things that talk. Uh, the, the, and I'd read the uh, the big book, and I and I read the literature, and I I, I had copies of the of the four step guide. Uh, but I fought it all the way, and when I got ready to do it, I did it and I unloaded. And I was a, I was doing everything backwards that they told me to do. I said I would never write this step. And just for the simple reasons you people told me that, I'm going to have to sit down and write it. Or it's suggested. Uh, by the time I was into my fifth step, I was writing it because I, at that particular time, when the time was right, I unloaded everything. And I, I wanted to unload it so fast that uh, the person I was taking away says, why don't you write this down, some of these things, and we'll, we'll discuss them later on. I did my fourth step with a, uh, a therapist who was also an alcoholic. He gave me a lot of good feedback. Uh, I'd heard around the program that uh, that in order in order to get on past the sixth, the fifth step, that I was going to have to do these things, and that's where I was at for all these years. I was on the first half of the first step, and that was it. Uh, when I when I finally got into the fourth step, doing the fourth and the fifth step, is that uh, this started removing all of my preoccupation with with myself, all of the past and the future. They say in uh, uh, this is where I was exactly at. I, I was worrying about what had happened and what was going to happen. And no today. Uh, after I got into it and uh, got reasonably done with it, and, and, and I had to go back. I had to get rid of all the resentments I had. They said this would be the number one thing that you better get rid of is the resentments that you're carrying around, you're carrying them around in you, and they're killing you. And I had resentments of pe against people, uh, dead and alive. I uh, uh, had, to, had some real deep resentments against against parents. So I had to take this thing all the way back, and uh, I had to I had to do the searching, soul searching that I had to do, and find out the whys and the whens and whatever. I don't have to do that today. This is one of the things that I've gotten out of the fourth and fifth step is that I don't have to worry about these things anymore. I've straightened them out in my life, and uh, I can go on and uh, do other things. I'm not preoccupied with what has happened and what somebody did to me, or uh, uh, I'm going to get even, or uh, whatever. I, I just don't have to do that anymore. I haven't got time for that anymore. I've got 24 hours a day on my hand, too, and it's not enough time. This is where I, I started getting involved in the program. Uh, it opened the door for spirituality. I had to go back after I took this fourth and fifth step, and I had to look at that second and third, because uh, there was no room for uh, for any of that. And, and I didn't believe I was insane, even though I had a lot of problems. Uh, and somebody told me along the line that, uh, you know, drinking is only a symptom of my underlying problems, and it became my biggest problem. And I wasn't going to get to any of my other problems until I got rid of this problem. So that's what I did. And then I, I started taking a good look at Bill, and I was scared. And when I got done with my fourth and fifth step and with this person I was taking, taking what they told me one thing, whatever happened before to you and if anybody caused you any pain or however, that that was shame on them. From this day forward, if anything that you suffer from or whatever is shame on you. I had to take responsibility, and I didn't like that. I felt like I was after I got done with this. At this particular time, is that I was standing there bare naked, facing the world. I, I had never been to this point in life before, never. I always had something to uh, hide behind. I had nothing to hide behind anymore. I, 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 I just had it. It took a traumatic thing to get me to do this. Uh, I almost died, and that's what it took took to get me to even take a good, close look at the fourth and fifth steps. And I did. I unloaded all of this, and uh, uh, these things. And, and I, I had a lot of defects of character. I, I 
I had these resentments. I, I was a very angry person. Uh, I had all these things. Uh, depression. These are when a lot of these things started going away. And as I got into the other steps <laughs> after this, and then going back and looking at uh, one, two, and three, and saying, hey, my life is unmanageable, and, uh, and I came to believe in that higher power. And uh, today my life has totally changed. I, I do, and this is a changing point in my life where I do everything for a totally different reason than I did before. Everything I do. You couldn't get me to do anything unless I could see some kind of reward for it. Uh, it didn't have to be monetary, but I'm going to tell you one thing. Somebody would pay for anything that I'd done for it in some way. I don't have to do that anymore. I I, uh, I, I feel free, and this is where the, they they give us the promises, and the freedom that I've got now. And I like what the speaker said last night about nobody can live rent free in my head. The whole thing out of all of this, and this is where I got my start, was in that fourth and fifth step, is I get to be me today, and that's the biggest success story of the year. I get to be me. I don't have to be anybody. I don't have to emulate anybody. I don't have to, uh, you know, let anybody, like he says, to live in my head to control my life. I made some feeble attempts at this thing during this 18-year period. When I came to the program, I, I had never been in, uh, I compare it. I'd done, you know, I had that attitude of, uh, uh, I'm not that bad yet. And a lot of things was bad because I got to the program. And then a lot of things happened within that period of just hanging around the program <laughs> on the fringes and getting into the program. <clears throat> I bought every guide that they had available for the fourth step. And I had to buy a folder to put them in. And it had to have two pockets on it. I bought the guide to the fourth step, the revised guide to the fourth step, the revised guide to that revised guide. <laughs> and I put them all on one side. And I bought a note, had a notebook paper and put them in the other pocket. Then I got a black pencil, a red pencil. <laughs> And a green pencil. I still don't know what the green pencil was for. I have figured out what the black and the red one was. And I have tucked them all neatly in this folder, and everything had to be perfect. I folded it together, and about ten years later, when we had a, when we had a garage sale, I found that. Uh, so that was one people attempt I made. Uh, I was in a, in a long-term rehab uh, program at, uh, well, I was in Sacred Heart. And I thought you had to do all these things. I, I realized today that they had us do all these things, the, all 12 steps, to get us familiar with them. And at the time, I thought you had to do them in order to get the hell out of there. <laughs> and I could have walked out that door any time I wanted to. That's how scared I was. I didn't want to go back out there. But they said, uh, I forget how many weeks it was that, that they, uh, that I'd been there, 9, 10, 11 weeks, something like that. And they said, uh, you will write your fourth step now. So I did. I stayed up all night and I, uh, did the autobiography thing and threw paper away and this, that, and the other. And just finally scribbled something down because I was going to have to see my counselor the next day. <laughs> so I took the papers in there to him. And he took them from me, and he put them in file 13, without even looking. And I could have killed him. <laughs> the only thing he asked me, he says, do you want to take the fifth step? And I already had an answer to that. I said, sure. He says, you want to take it with me? And I said, no. <laughs> and I had this planned out. you got to realize that I was in Detroit, and Pontiac is up here, and my home was right in the middle of the tube. Well, I'd been one of the residents up there at the Funny Farm at Clinton Valley or the state institution anyway. And I told him that the person I wanted to take my fifth step with was the doctor I had when I was in that 
a 60-day diagnostic or whatever it was. I don't know. But he agreed with me, and, I, and so I immediately asked him, I said, well, since I'm here, and, and it'll probably take me a long time to do this fifth step, according to what I'm hearing from everybody, is that could I just stay at home that night? Now, I hadn't been home in nine or, nine or ten or eleven weeks, and uh, things had calmed down at home, and, and things were going along pretty good, so I figured I'd get home. And he, he agreed. I, I didn't quite understand it, but anyway, I, in order to keep it honest, because I was very honest at this point, as I did, I went out to that state institution and I talked to that doctor. Now, I have to explain this doctor to you. He is fresh over from China, Dr. Yang. <laughs> Couldn't entirely speak a word of English. And him and I, you know, him and I got along fine. <laughs> and... <laughs> then the granddaddy, all my fist steps trying to take them, the people attempts. Somewhere along the line, like I said, I didn't, I do the opposite of whatever you told me to do. <clears throat> Somebody said at the table, I heard it over and over again, don't take this with your wife. So I said, all right, that's who I'll take it with. <laughs> <laughs> so we sit down at the kitchen table and we looked at each other and we had coffee there and everything had to be a perfect setting you know everything else. so I looked at her and I says I've got a lot of things I want to tell you honey and I want to get all these things off my chest I want to do that fifth step now she's she's been an hour on she knew what these steps were and I don't think I got past the third word. My wife has got an eyebrow. She's very concerned. It goes up high mass. And that eyebrow just shot up there. And I, said, oh. I knew I was doing the wrong thing right there. So I quit. That was a people attempt there, too. But I did do these things, and, and, and I'm a firm believer of uh, the speaker I heard in Toronto earlier this year that this is a step that has to be done over, like all the rest of the steps. He said that that we hear around the program all the time, and most of us say it is don't drink and go to the meetings, and that's the name of the game. And he says, I'm here to tell you another thing that needs to go with that, or something to that effect. He says, I'm here to tell you that don't drink, go to the meetings, and work the 12 steps. And he paused and he said over and over and over again. Because any time we're not doing this and we're not working the 12 steps, we have, again, untreated alcoholism. I lost a lot of sleep last night. This is the first time I've been up in front of a, anybody at a conference. And especially the 75,000 of you that are sitting out there right now. Uh, this is, this is a first for me. And I have to go through a lot of anxiety when something new comes up in this program. I got involved in service. And, uh, in the, in the GSR is, is my, my involvement today. And this all stems from right here at the fourth, fifth, and sixth step. Because uh, uh, this is where it started for me. And like I said, I had to go back and pick up on those others. Because, uh, then I knew. And uh, when Peg asked me to, if I would fill this spot, I said, sure, anything, Peg. So you got anything in Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> That's next month. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of joking around, and but I'll tell you, the program is very serious. To me. I wasn't a very serious person all my life, and uh, got me into a lot of trouble. My sponsor today, the one I have at the present time, that was another thing. During that 18 years, I had a number of sponsors, and I fired 95% of them because they wanted to talk about program, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. The sponsor I have today, he says, you show me a person that will listen to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'll show you a person that can get the program and live a better life. And this is a house cleaning. We don't, 
We don't have any room inside us for, for new things if we don't clean that house out. I am not preoccupied with, uh, with all those things today. Uh, I think my time's about up. Thank God. <laughs> I heard yesterday, I think it was at that hot, that hot potato thing. I've never been to any one of them before. And I heard just exactly what I needed to hear in there. The guy said, I spoke at a panel at a conference one time, and I froze up and couldn't say a word. And I thought about that all day yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and my, prob my problem today is that sometimes it's, it's hard to get started, but then I don't want to shut up. <laughs> but I'm glad... That, that this is uh, a thing that, I, that I've gotten into now, and I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. Like I said, all 75,000 of you. And uh, I thank you all. And I'll thank the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'm sure glad you took four or five there and got into service work. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you again. Now we have Doug H. from Kalamazoo on steps seven, eight, nine. I'm Doug, and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Hi, everybody. Grateful to be here and grateful to be sober this morning. Well, it's great. 75,000 people got up early this morning and drove to Lansing to listen to me talk about humility. <laughs> so, that's all right. <laughs> uh, I'm real humble. But. I was asked to be on this panel several months ago, and at the time I thought, well, great, you know, it's about time that I got more involved in service work and uh, gives me plenty of time to get prepared and <coughs> all that, so... Of course, a couple months went by and I still hadn't done anything. And got down to the last couple of weeks and uh, all hell broke loose. <laughs> the, the last two or three, uh, the last three weeks, really, it uh, seems like nothing has gone the way that I wanted it to go, the way that I planned it. And uh, I, uh, three weeks ago, I had ear surgery, and uh, that didn't help my attitude any. You know, I, I can't hear out of my left ear, and my balance is off and all that, and plus other things that have happened. And uh, so I got to thinking more and more, boy, I, you know, I ought to back out. I ought to back out, you know. And uh, <clears throat> perfect opportunity came up a week ago, because the gentleman that was supposed to speak on the first three steps <coughs> I was planning on riding here with and uh, he told me he wouldn't be able to make it and I was sorry for him but I thought oh good now maybe I can get out of it <laughs> and, and uh, a good excuse you know and uh, I used the excuse that well maybe it wasn't it's my higher power's will that I not that I not be there you know and then uh, the only problem is that I try real hard to uh, keep myself surrounded with the winners in this program, and uh, they wouldn't buy that, you know. <laughs> yeah. One of them told me that, uh, you know, it's uh, never my higher power's will that I shirk my responsibilities. And... Uh, <coughs> <coughs> That this is a responsibility that, that I should be here, you know, and uh, so I had to make a half attempt anyway to find another ride, you know, and, and for two or three days I asked around to different people who I knew were coming, <laughs> and then I, and uh, someone told me that uh, we're supposed to be willing to go to any length. And that's true. And uh, so I 
at the last minute, the last couple of days, you know, I'd really been asking around trying to find a ride here, and uh, none of it seemed to pan out. And then uh, the night before last, I called a gentleman and didn't get no answer. I called for three or four hours and uh, didn't get no answer. And the next day, I called, yesterday morning, I called. And his roommate said, well, I think he already went, you know, and I thought, well, yeah, maybe it isn't God's will that I'd be there, you know, but about four o'clock yesterday afternoon, my wife said, you better try one more time. And uh, I tried and he was home and I'm here. So <laughs> it wasn't God's will that I missed us today, but uh, I sure made an attempt and uh, I'm also going to have the chance to practice these steps that uh, that I'm talking on today because uh, I had to get humble and, and, and ask my higher power that, you know, if I was meant to be here, that, that a ride be given to me. And also, I uh, really didn't prepare until late last night. And uh, so if it sounds like I'm reading some of this, I am. <laughs> And uh, so I have to make my amends for that. But uh, the seventh step is we humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. And uh, in the second paragraph of uh, page 72 of the 12 and 12, it says, For just so long as we were convinced that we could live exclusively by our own individual strength and intelligence, for just that long was a working faith and a higher power impossible. This was true even when we believed that God existed. We could actually have earnest religious beliefs which remained barren because we were still trying to play God ourselves. As long as we placed self-reliance first, a genuine reliance upon a higher power was out of the question. That basic ingredient of all humility, the desire to seek and do God's will, was missing. <coughs> when I finally admitted that... Uh, and accepted that I was powerless over alcohol and my life was unmanageable. Uh, it wasn't hard for me to become humble enough to uh, <coughs> admit to my higher power that I couldn't handle it all by myself, you know, and, and to ask for his help. But I felt that if my life was unmanageable because of alcohol, now that God had removed that, you know, that... Uh, everything else should fall into place and I should be able to handle the rest of the everyday problems and everything all by myself. You know. <clears throat> and uh, as long as I had this attitude, my growth was real slow if not non-existent in this program. Uh, it took several incidences which I had no control over before I was really ready to admit that all areas of my life was unmanageable and that I couldn't manage it without the help of my higher power. <clears throat> and I had to admit that uh, self-will and, and uh, self-reliance wasn't going to get it. I finally realized that any strength or intelligence that I had was, was a free gift from God, you know, and nothing that, that I had done of my own free will and nothing that I got of myself. And uh, not until I could admit this to myself could I uh, have enough faith to say that that I can't do it, you can, and uh, please remove these things that, that are standing in the way of, of a better relationship with you. Yeah. Walking around muttering the uh, serenity prayer whenever I'm in a tough situation or laying in bed at night and uh, thanking my higher power for another day of sobriety is not enough for me. Uh, my strength comes when I'm willing to get down on my knees and uh, humble myself enough to uh, <coughs> ask for his will. And until I let go of my own will and allow God to work in my life, I get nowhere. <coughs> when I step back and admit that I can't do it, then it all seems to come together for me. There's a point that, I, that I've heard quite often used in Kalamazoo lately that, uh, <coughs> that really says it for me and that uh, 
I'd like to share with you now. It's uh, titled, Let Go and Let God. And it goes, As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But then instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last I snatched them back and cried, How could you be so slow? My child, he said, what could I do? You never did let go. And uh, a lot of times I'm unwilling to let go of things and allow my higher power to work in my life. But when I finally do, I mean, things do come together for me. <coughs> Step eight, says we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. I had a real hard time with this step <coughs> because... Uh, I felt that there were a lot of people that had done me real injustice, you know, and whatever I did back, they deserved. <coughs> and uh, so why should I apologize? You know, it was easy to admit my part in cases where the other person really didn't deserve what I had done to them, you know. <coughs> but uh, <coughs> I'd lived by the old Bible adage, an eye for an eye for so long, you know, that it was really hard for me to get humble enough to admit that uh, I had to do my part before I could go on with my program, before I could get anywhere with my program, <laughs> before I could come to terms with myself and forgive myself in any way. And uh, <coughs> this took an incident uh, where my younger brother whom I'd had a ongoing feud with for several years to uh, have it. He had an automobile accident and uh, wasn't expected to live. And when I got the phone call, I knew right away that uh, if I didn't make the effort to, to make the amends that I had to make, that I may never get that chance again. So I got on my knees and, and I asked my higher power, I told my higher power that, it, that if he would allow my brother to live, that uh, I wouldn't hold back anymore. You know, I would get on with, with my inventory, with my uh, amends, no matter how tough it was for me to swallow. You know, and, uh, my brother did survive the accident and I got busy right away and I was able to make amends with him. And today we have a lot better relationship than we ever did. We don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but at least we can talk and we've forgiven each other for the past. And after I'd done that, it was easier for me to uh, realize that I have to do my part with, with everyone that I have problems with in the past and anyone that I had hurt in any way. Uh, <coughs> Step 9 says, we may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Uh, I make my direct amends to my family and close friends on a daily basis, I think, by trying to live this program to the best of my ability a day at a time. But it was necessary for me to go to these people and uh, make the effort to tell them that I was sorry for the things I had done, except in cases where somebody would get hurt. You know, and uh, I feel that in, in some instances that except when to do so would injure them or others, I'm one of those others too, you know, and if it's going to cause me a great deal of harm and, and uh, get in the way of my program, in some rare cases, then uh, I think that this should not be done, but uh, also, you know, I, I it's real important for me to make the effort to contact those people that I don't see <coughs> and to admit my wrongs to them. And in most cases, I found out that, that the outcome wasn't near as bad as I thought it would be. Uh, <coughs> there, you know, there are some 
some things that, that will take time, and some relationships that will take time to mend. And there are others that uh, maybe it never will happen. But uh, the important thing is that, that I make the effort and that I forgive myself. You know, and I couldn't go on with this program. I couldn't get anywhere until I could learn to like me and to forgive myself for some of the past and accept that it was a part of the disease and that if I don't live in that way anymore, then, then I am making amends. <coughs> and all the time that I've been in this program, you know, I've, I've been in a lot of meetings where the promises have been read and, and discussed, you know, and uh, it wasn't until recently that I really realized, you know, it takes a while to sink into this <laughs> thick skull of mine that, that the promises are a part of the ninth step. And uh, none of these things that are in the promises really began to happen for me until I made an honest effort to work this step. And uh, in closing, I'd like to read those promises from page 83 and 84 of the big book. <laughs> we are painstaking about this phase of our development. We will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could do, what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. As I try and work this program to the best of my ability a day at a time, I've realized that, that many times through the past few years, those promises have come true for me, you know, and it's maybe not on a daily basis, but I am beginning to feel that, that this program is working for me and that some of these things that I thought when I first heard the promises, you know, for a while, man, you know, I can't even imagine those things ever happening for me. You know, I can't ever even imagine ever having those kind of feelings. And uh, today it happens. And it's because of this program and because of you people that I am sober and happy today. And thank you for listening to me. And now we have uh, Frederica to cover steps 10, 11, and 12 from Lansing. My name is Frederica. Alcoholic. Very grateful to be here and to be sober. And Doug, I'm glad you read those promises. You know, they are materializing in my life today, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. And I know it's all the result of these um, steps. Um, on the tenth step, continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. The continuing of my personal inventory has been going back and looking through and practicing the principles in those first nine steps. You know, have I continued to admit that I'm powerless over alcohol, that my life has become unmanageable? Have I continued to come to believe that there is a power greater than myself? Have I made that decision? Have I written that four-step inventory and shared it? You know, have I asked that my defects be removed? Um, have I become willing? You know, have I become willing to make amends to those people? And have I made that list? Uh, all those things are part of the continuation process in my life. You know, recently I've had an experience with coming to believe something else again. And, and knowing that I was going to be talking on the 10th, 11th, and 12th steps, um, I became very aware of what those meant to me and how I practiced those principles. And during the course of continuing to take this inventory, it dawned on me 
that during that inventory, it tells me what I need to do, which step I need to go back and concentrate more heavily on. You know, I try to practice these principles on a daily basis. But sometimes it's necessary for me to sit down and write out another four steps. You know, those resentments continue to occur in my life. Um, and I found the other day, I was told the other day, that as long as I continue to live, those things were going to continue to happen. So I have to continue to write four steps. I have to continue to take those inventory. <clears throat> and I have to continue to, you know, ask for my defects to be removed. Sometimes I can get off into a, a task of trying to remove my own defects of character. You know, sometimes I can just get in this little hole and I can continue to fight and continue to try to climb out. And taking a an inventory, as is suggested in the 10th step, will bring to light that I can't do it. You know, I need to ask God to remove those defects of character. And I just have to um, continue on that. And, you know, the uh, I had a, a recent experience that just really sticks out in me in terms of the 10th step and someone taking an inventory and coming and sharing with me <clears throat> that he felt that he was wrong and admitting it to me. When I had put in my mind that when I went to Belding, I was going to say to this gentleman who I was rather tarse with at a service meeting uh, that I, you know, could have uh, been a little more gentle with my voice. The message was what it was, but the way that I communicated that was not a very nice way to do it. When I went to Belding to the workshop, he came up to me, and he made an amend, and he said that he was taking the 10th step. And it really works that way, and Al, I'll never forget it. I just, you know, it's what this program is about to me, seeing people practice these principles. The promptly admitting uh, that we're wrong, uh, for me, that promptly is I need to admit to myself first. I need to promptly admit to Frederica that I am wrong. Self-deception is the exact nature of my disease. And I can tell you and promptly admit to you that I'm wrong. But when it comes to admitting to Frederica, that's a different story. And I have to be aware that I have to promptly admit it to me. And then I can go about the business of uh, doing whatever is necessary. If it's necessary for me to admit it to you, then fine. For a long time, I promptly admitted that I was wrong and ran around in this little pity thing of being wrong all the time. And after being sober for a little while, I realized that I was just not a big fat wrong. You know, I just wasn't, and that I wasn't wrong all the time. Uh, so I had to learn to practice these principles to keep from having that attitude of being wrong all the time. Um, and I continue to work on that. You know, this uh, 11th step, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry it out. Uh, after, you know, taking this inventory, then it's time for me to sit down and seek and pray. And, you know, I discovered very early that I had to have a God as I understood him in my life before I could seek Thanks through prayer and meditation. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. And, Sober you know, I had it all backwards free, for a while. I decided like I was going to seek through prayer and meditation so if you'd like when to help I really didn't have um, a God in my life. Uh, it's a rather confusing time for me. Thank you know, you I just, there was a sense of comfort to me when the fog began to lift in my life. And I realized that it was okay for me to pray. It was okay for me to talk about God in my life and my relationship with God. Because that had never been okay. You know, I was raised in a very strict Catholic home. But we never talked about our relationship with God. Um, we didn't know uh, about this loving God that I have come to know since I've been in this fellowship and never talked about it. You know, you were some kind of fanatic. I can remember my mother saying when I was a child telling me not to read the Bible because my extreme personality would take everything out of context and just go crazy. And it was a forbidden thing um, for me to do. And I couldn't talk about that. I couldn't tell people that, you know, there were times when I hurt and I wanted to talk to God, but I was afraid to talk to God, even afraid to acknowledge such a God existed because I felt like I was going to be doomed for everything that I had previously done. 
But today, you people taught me about this loving God as we understand him. And this loving God who shows me on a daily basis what his will is for me. And, you know, I, I struggled a lot with God's will for my life. And I have a loving sponsor that pointed out to me that this step continues on to say the power to carry out what God's will is. You know, somebody earlier talked about God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that power, you know, I don't get it because I decide one day I'm going to go out and get a bag of power, and then I'll have the power to carry out God's will. You know, I get it simply uh, because it's a promise to me. You know, it's one of those promises uh, that Doug talked about in the big book, that God will give me the power to carry out his will. You know, I don't have to be in this total isolated world just struggling to be good, whatever good means, and that he is going to give me a sense of power. You know, this powerlessness over alcohol gives me my power in my relationship with God. And on the 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice his principles in all of our affairs. You know, I firmly believe that my spiritual awakening has come about as the direct result of these 12 steps. But you know, I had some, exper some spiritual experiences very early in the program. I remember when I was sober for two weeks, and I got up one morning and I was beginning to feel halfway like a person again. And I had this just real awareness that, my God, I hadn't had a drink in two weeks. You know, it was just the greatest um, experience that I've had in all my years of sobriety. Two weeks' time, I didn't have to have a drink. And if that's not a spiritual awareness, you know, I don't know what it is. And I knew that it wasn't anything I had done except go to meetings and not drink in between and ask for help. You know, it's just that, that whole thing of I'll never forget it. You know, I cried. I still cry a lot. <laughs> but it's just, you know, the, the awareness of this God in my life. The... Karen, trying to carry this message to other alcoholics, the message that I have to carry today is the message of this program and what these 12 steps have done for me in my life. You know, I do a lot of what is referred to as 12-step work, um, and I'm not... A few years ago, <clears throat> Holly M. told me that I was running around and doing a lot of 12-step calls, and I was sponsoring people and doing all this stuff, and she said to me, Frederica, the reason that you have to do that is because you have a lot of defects of character. And in order for your defects to be removed, you have to help other people through their process and through their recovery. And I guess I still have a lot of defects of character because I still do a lot of sponsoring, and I still do a lot of 12-step calls. I'm on the answering service here in Lansing from our central office. And I just about know when it's going to be my weekend to get called. I don't know whether they have a pattern down there or what it is. But I, I just have that feeling. I can have an absolutely crazy week, get into a pity bag, start feeling sorry for myself, and I can be rest assured that my telephone is going to ring all weekend long. And this is one of those weekends that that's supposed to be happening. So I got a room here at the hotel, so I won't have to answer the call. But, you know, I have to pray for the willingness on that, because when that phone rings, I know that somebody needs help. And I'm not always willing. And sometimes I'll say to the woman in the answering service, I'll say, well, do they need somebody to come and see them, or do they want to talk to somebody, or what do they want? And... You know, I, I heard myself saying that at one time, and I thought, my God, Frederica, right then being able to stop and take that inventory and look at me and what I was doing and what I was saying and realizing that, you know, all I had to do was pray for the willingness. Whether I wanted to or not didn't make any difference. But if I took time and said, God, help me to be willing to do whatever it is that you want me to do when I answer this call. And it just makes things a whole lot easier. You know, I found out that I haven't had to clean up any vomit in a while. And in spite of treatment centers, you know, I'm one of those people that usually ends up in a situation where somebody does dumb things and I end up, you know, uh, cleaning up. I, I don't like to do that. But it's, it's a message for me that I have to be willing to do that. I am so grateful for this gift that you people have given me. 
just so grateful for it. And, you know, when they were reading how it works when I first came into the program, and they talked about being willing to go to any length to maintain our sobriety, I thought any length at that time meant that I was willing to walk, you know, seven miles from my home to a meeting uh, when I had too much pride to pick up the phone and call somebody and ask them for a ride, or doing all these other kinds of things. And um, I later found out that the willingness to go to any length means my willingness to be of maximum service to God and my fellow. And it doesn't necessarily mean going seven miles. You know, I my willingness to pick up that phone and call and ask for a ride. I have a car today, and I can actually drive that car, and I can see, and I have reflexes and all this stuff that I didn't have at the time I came into this program. And things continue to change. And the practicing these principles in all of our affairs, you know, I struggled with principles. Uh, I am an al analyst by profession, and I needed to know what the principles were. And it took me a long time to try to figure out what the principles of this program, you know, what are these principles? What does that mean? There's 12 steps, but what are the principles? And I was in a meeting once, and this person was talking and said something about the principles of this program are honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And I thought, gee, you know, if I try to practice those in all of my affairs, my life is so much better. And, you know, I found that it also makes the lives of those people around me much better. Um, you know, I'm just, just really grateful to be here this morning and to be sober and to be able to share. You know, for a long time I didn't feel like I had anything. And I gave a talk in Jackson a few years back and I said something about, well, I don't know if you got anything out of what I gave or not and I didn't have much to share. And this gentleman picked up the big book and read on the page 164. And it reminds me that if I have one day of sobriety, one moment of sobriety that I can share with someone else and how I am learning to live without the use of alcohol in my life, then I have something to give away. And today I continue to learn to live without alcohol. And I just, you know, there really is for me today joy in living. There really is. And I never thought I would see that. You know, I didn't want to live and I didn't want to die. And I thought I was going to be doomed forever to be in the situation that I was. But through practicing these principles and trying, and I try on a daily basis, I have to pray for willingness on a daily basis, and have to pray to be willing to share with you people, talk to you people, and realize that it is unconditional love that you give me. You know, uh, I was told, reminded again this morning, that there's nothing that you can do wrong in this program. And I need that reassurance. Uh, I do, I used to have a tendency to be a perfectionist, but I think some people kind of calmed me down a little bit on that and telling me that was my ego and pride getting in the way. But I'm just really grateful to be here and to be sober. And, you know, it looks like 75,000 people out there to me this morning. Thank you. I'd like to thank Donna, EJ, Doug, Frederica, and Bill once again. Thank you very much. For those of you that care to, you can join me in the Lord's Prayer. We'll close this meeting. Our Father, Trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, 